Uh, I'm excited to be able to be joined by C staff <clears throat> to continue this important discussion on the opioid epidemic. Um, epidemic and uh, a little bit of the opioid uh, information and program in the backseat to deal with those concerns and uh, those situations. However, uh, going forward, we're starting to come out of the crisis. However, epidemic has not uh, been coming out of the crisis. In fact, it might have been uh, increasing um, throughout our time as we've been um, dealing with COVID. And if you can only imagine with the COVID crisis having a mental impact on people, um, there is a connection potential with opioids and uh, fentanyl and all those other resources. A little bit of back, background about this uh, presentation and, and where we're at today. Uh, when I started this uh, opioid task force way back when, probably six years ago, um, we uh, had a cert or a, a think tank back in DC that um, provided us with information on how we can best attack the opioid crisis and, and utilize the six pillars that they came up with. We use those pillars of information to formulate um, some ideas and some programs that we're um, still trying to task with, or we're still trying to manage today. But um, as we've gone forward, the uh, opioid epidemic has, as we've been said, has been increasing. Uh, we're getting regional support right now. Our um, uh, opioid committee has been housed in MAG, so uh, the Maricopa Association of Governments is helping us with uh, this crisis, along with mental health and homelessness uh, to deal with. Uh, but with that said, um, and as public safety has uh, been challenged over the past many years and, and presently, I think we have a uh, presentation today that's really going to hit home um, with what uh, our fire and police officers in cooperation, even with ASU, um, to help capture this data and with our um, uh, wastewater uh, information that we have, uh, along with uh, other information that we get from the state and county, we really have a, a potential of a program that's going to make an impact uh, on our community and is really going to help us going forward uh, to tackle potentially even other issues, um, not related to opioids, but maybe to mental health and homelessness. So this, uh, this program that we're going to hear today has a real potential um, to really have um, some real good uh, resources for people that are in need. And I think this is going to be a, an outstanding presentation. So I'm glad that we have people here today uh, listening in on our topic and be able to understand what we're going to do going forward. Uh, I think first up, we're going to have Nick Ells and Dana Cardenas, uh, an RN that is with our CARE 7 program. They're going to start off the presentation first. And then we're going to dive into um, PD and, and we'll uh, have those introductions here as we uh, go through the 1st section here. And uh, I'm going to let Nick and Dana, why don't you guys go ahead and tee it up if you, if you will, and we'll go from there. Thank you, council member Navarro. I appreciate it. Well, we looked at, uh, at the opioid epidemic that uh, we're facing, not only here in the city of Tempe, but across the state of Arizona. It's not 1 that we can tie just to illegal drugs or legal opiates. These are prescription medications as well. Um, these are, are, are things that our community um, is not immune to at, in any demographic. We look across the state of Arizona. We've had, we're looking at two people or more a day die from, uh, from this epidemic. Um, I'm gonna take you guys through some data uh, from what we've gathered um, and what our crews are seeing on the streets every day to try and give you an idea of, of what this epidemic looks like and what we're still faced against. Next slide, please. So the facts are clear. When we look at our opioid data back in 2017, we were looking at um, in January, approximately 24 opioid related incidents um, a month. That shot us in July of 17. Uh, we did see a, a, a small break in, in February of, of 2018 of only 16 incidents. But then we've been holding pretty steady around 50 incidents in around the summer of 2018. Um, and I want to, I want you guys to keep in mind when that number, where that number is and, and what it was, um, because we're going to show you direct correlation later on. Um, 
you know, through the pandemic, you can see that we have a rise in our opioid related or opioid related type incidents and overdoses all the way until uh, April. Uh, this last month, we saw a drastic increase to 63, which is the most that we've seen yet to date. Next slide. This chart right here shows the average amount of Narcan dose that our fire crews are having to administer um, to bring people uh, back, to get them to a point to where they're breathing again. Um, when we looked at uh, around 2016, when we were looking at regular uh, type of opiates, like uh, prescription type of medications um, and, uh, and, and heroin, we were at about two and a quarter uh, milligrams of, of Narcan to get somebody back to that point. Um, you see a large rise in that number going in February or January 2018 to about uh, near four, uh, four milligrams, which is double the dose that we were originally having to do. And as you notice, that trend keeps getting higher and higher for the amount of milligrams that we're going to, that we have to use of Narcan to bring somebody back out of, uh, out of uh, the state that they're in all the way up to about five and a quarter right now. We contribute that drastic rise, not only to the prescription medication um, challenge that, that we're seeing, but to fentanyl and carfentanil. Um, these are synthetic opioids. The synthetic opioids are hundreds of times more powerful than a regular prescription medication. So it takes a whole lot more Narcan to reverse the actual effects um, of, that, of that synthetic opioid. Next slide. When we looked at the Arizona Public Health Association, you can see that uh, yellow line right there. That's our synthetic narcotics, our fentanyl, our carfentanil, um, and stuff like that. When you look at 2018, where our, our Arizona Opioid Epidemic Act was enacted, this is right in line with the trends that we're seeing on opioid doses and the amount of Narcan we're having to use. What we're looking at in the, in the community is a lot more synthetic opioid um, type of overdose incidents. Next slide. This graph right here shows the age groups in which we're actually looking at um, that are that are most susceptible to the the, OP, sorry, the, the overdose age groups um, that we're looking at for the, the opioid overdoses. When we looked at 2016, it was uh, just over 50%. If we fast forward to 2021, between ages uh, 20 and 39, take up the vast majority of it, which is sitting right around 70%. Next slide. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dana Cardenas. She's uh, uh, my nurse with the uh, Patient Advocate Services Program. Good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna be speaking today about Tempe Fire Medical Rescue's community opioid outreach efforts. And um, it is a multi-departmental and community collaborative. And with the Tempe um, Task Force, we have come together with Tempe Coalition, CARE 7, Tempe PD, um, AZ National Guard, Not My Kid Foundation, and Community Bridges, just some of the community collaboratives and city um, departmental collaboratives that we have. And really the goal is outreach education and awareness to the entire community. Next slide. One of the projects that we had is a DEA drug take back project, and this offers a safe um, way of discarding unused medications that we may have in our medicine cabinet. We had two very successful projects this year, one in January um, that we recovered 26 pounds of medication. Uh, we just had one in April and we were really proud of that because we were able to have uh, the community come out and we actually recovered 65 pounds of unused medications that we were able to safely discard. Uh, the goal of this is really to keep unused medications out of the medicine cabinets and out of the reach of some of our young um, kids, uh, youth, and some of our vulnerable family members and friends that may have an addiction issue. Next slide. So one of the things that um, we're really excited about is um, we have a QR code project. Um, this is really an innovative way of being able to spread awareness out into our community. 
And really just like you would go to any restaurant, uh, you can scan with your smartphone a QR code. And what that would do is just bring up a 30 minute or a 30 second um, opioid PSA or public service announcement that would also have um, vital resources uh, for those that are needing to seek uh, additional resources for help, uh, maybe for their family members or even themselves. Uh, we've got a series of training videos that we're looking to target with the um, youth and targeting specifically middle school and high school age students and also the community. Um, we've got a series of uh, training videos that we're going to be putting out uh, to educate community members and even our city employees. Um, some of these QR codes you might be seeing around the city of Tempe on public public transit um, areas and also maybe um, our city buildings. Next slide, please. Another project that we're doing is our opioid awareness campaign and um, we've got um, our opioid campaign is shatter the stigma. We're going to have a series of things that are going to be coming out here in the near future and um, we're really proud of this. Um, this uh, collaborative effort is um, really wanting to get and reach the awareness of everyone in our community. Um, it's not just a problem that affects low socioeconomic communities, but it affects everyone. It impacts all of our families, our schools, and all of our entire community. Opioid addiction does not discriminate. Everyone who's had dental work, an injury, or an accident has probably had some type of prescription medication uh, given to them. So we really want to make sure that we are shattering that stigma that this does not discriminate and that anyone is susceptible. That's why we want to make sure that our outreach is to everyone in the community. And if they need any help, um, there is a huge outreach here in the city of Tempe. You can always reach out to any of us if you need anything. Next slide. Hey, Rob, I think you're muted. Of technology. Sorry about that. Um, I'll start over. So, uh, my name is Rob Ferraro. I'm a sergeant with the Tempe Police Department. Um, seated with me is Erica Chestnut Ramirez. Uh, she is the regional vice president over Impact Suicide Prevention Center based here in Tempe. Uh, so, one of my roles in the, in the police department is overseeing uh, this project that we're about to present on the Tempe Opioid uh, Response Project within the police department. And just to start off, admittedly so, I think the police department in Tempe uh, was a little bit slow in, in rolling out Narcan uh, for officers. And uh, uh, departments across the country were, were essentially arming their, their officers with Narcan, uh, with, with these uh, nasal, if you can see these nasal uh, spray Narcan. Uh, and so we wanted to uh, be thoughtful and, and uh, have an, a different type of rollout with Narcan. That was more not only just equipping our officers with Narcan, but then also addressing a lot of the the post crisis gap uh, that we were seeing. So not just rolling up on scene, administering Narcan, and then the individual goes to the hospital and then walks out, um, but really trying to make sure that they're connected to resources out in the community uh, following that crisis. So this was an approach that was uh, presented to Tempe PD through our partner Impact, uh, and it was really. Uh, rooted in CIT. CIT is crisis intervention team training, and it's about um, having quick responses, no door responses for officers when they're trying to bring an individual to a behavioral health resource in the community, that there's never a no answer for a police officer, that they'll be able to do to get that individual to help. And so this is the approach we really wanted to take and impact um, has really helped to develop that uh, through the years of CIT training, providing mobile crisis response teams in the community. Uh, and so that's how we frame this around. So this was a, a two year grant, uh, um, sorry, a four year grant through uh, SAMHSA federal agency. Uh, it was $2 million and it was going to be provide for one sworn position uh, in the police department. That's our, our Narcan officer who, who deals with the training aspect, ensuring that all of our officers have Narcan. And then 
two full-time positions from on the impact side that was going to provide for post-crisis transition and that navigator and we'll talk about that uh, briefly um, in the next few slides and then ultimately our last partner was arizona state university who's going to be conducting our evaluation on the project see about how the success was determining our were were we having successful outcomes and then ultimately to model that potentially across the country in terms of other responses uh, in the community. Paul, you can go to the next slide, please. So this is how basically it works. Uh, so every single uh, uniformed officer in the city of Tempe is carrying two doses of nasal Narcan on them. We, they have them in a pouch and it goes on their outer carrier. And so they have it at all times. Um, if an officer administers Narcan in the field, they then going back to that CIT type response, uh, ultimately, we'll call a uh, call a hotline. Uh, it's uh, monitored by uh, impact and uh, it's a 24 seven hotline. And ultimately they just let them know uh, the, the operator know we administered Narcan. This is the individual. This is where they're going uh, to what hospital that they might be going to. And then ultimately um, some very brief questions like, so where are they currently where they're going? Uh, was there any safety concerns that they that they might have for if a navigator is going to go out and contact them? It had to be very quick. It had to be very seamless, or we or we knew that the cop potentially was not going to be doing it because we were going to create hurdles. And that's that's that CIT framework that we talked about. So it had to be fast. Uh, and then finally, the officer documents it on a on a, a pre-filled card. Again, going back to making it very simple and easy. Next slide, Paul. So this part is is mine. So as Rob said, my name is Erica Chestnut Ramirez and I'm the regional vice president at Impact Suicide Prevention Center. So I oversee um, all of uh, logistics here at Impact. And uh, through this grant on our side, obviously Rob mentioned that we have a 24 seven hotline. Uh, and so we already had the infrastructure to be able to um, do this and partake in this project. So on, on the impact side, what happens is uh, the officer will then call our 24 seven hotline and the call taker will then dispatch um, one of our on duty crisis peer specialists if, if it's during regular business hours or they will call an on call for after hours. And uh, that individual, <clears throat> excuse me, will be given the information related to where the uh, individual who has been administered Narcan is being transported. So then uh, that peer will then make contact with that individual uh, at the hospital, wherever that individual was transported uh, within one hour. So we have a, a very short window. Um, in behavioral health, we talk about that as the, the window of insight for the individual. So sometimes, uh, you know, after an incident, there will be a moment of clarity where there's this idea of, I need to get help. There's something here that I need. And so it's really our goal to get out there during that window of insight to be able uh, to assist that individual. Um, we meet with them. We build that rapport with the individual. Uh, these peer specialists are actually individuals who have been through the behavioral health system or they have been through substance abuse treatment themselves. So there is a special bond um, that often occurs between that individual and the person who is uh, needing assistance. So they use that time to build rapport. They also um, talk about resources. They give them um, community Narcan so they can give they can meet with the families and give the family a Narcan kit as well so that if something ever happens in the future where there is another overdose the family is also armed to be able to administer that um, so they're given Narcan and then um, we also gain our, our release of information from that individual so that we can make appropriate referrals um, to other services. And, you know, one of the most important things about that is, you know, not only meeting with them within that hour, but then also providing post uh, crisis services um, for follow up. So with that individual, we can continue to work with them for the next 60 days, be able to provide transportation to their appointments, help them make appointments, um, get them to their services um, and, and help them with reentry into their work, into um, their job, into uh, school, wherever, whatever the situation might be for the individual. Next slide. 
And so this is where we're at currently. So total PD saves, uh, actually that number is 119 in 15 months. We had a double save uh, a few days back. So 119 saves in 15 months. Our, our expectation, our 12 month deliverable for the grant was 45. Uh, in that 12 month period, we had 101. Uh, so staggering uh, along the lines of what Chief Ells was talking about in terms of, of numbers. Enrolled in supportive services, uh, we, um, we have 105, and that's including referrals from fire. Uh, and our 12 month deliverable was 75 and, and actual, our actual number was 92. So exceeding expectations there. We were trained and equipped 361, that's 292 police employees uh, and 69 community members. And again, exceeding our expectations and our deliverables to SAMHSA. Uh, and then ultimately 252 kits distributed to survivors uh, and family members as well. And so when we talk about what resources we are connecting individuals to, Eric is gonna talk about in the last slide of what those, uh, what those things look like. Next slide, Paul. Yeah, so this was really, like Rob said, the crux of, of this program that really set this program um, aside from, from other programs throughout the country because there was that gap. So, you know, most departments carry Narcan, they administer it, the person gets released from the hospital, and there's, there's no follow-up, there's no um, connection to supports. And so some of these connections can be, they could go to outpatient treatment, they might be placed into residential services, um, intensive outpatient programming. So it might be um, outpatient treatment on steroids, basically, where they're, uh, it's kind of like a day program. Uh, MAT services, which is medication assisted treatment. Some individuals need uh, medication to help them throughout this process while they're getting treatment. And so they can, you know, that could, that could be methadone, that could be suboxone. Uh, some people might need inpatient hospitalization depending on their situation. And then we can help them with transportation, as I mentioned before, helping them with housing, their employment, um, just getting them food boxes, et cetera, and then helping them get connected to community resources such as AA, et cetera. Um, and then obviously working with the families, helping the families, getting them involved with, with maybe um, you know, family services. And then um, if the individual meets uh, criteria for SMI designation, we can help with the SMI service coordination as well. So that's our project. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, this is great. Uh, do we have any, Tim, are we waiting on Paul or anybody from community services presenting or are we? Yeah, or Paul Bentley is up next. Paul, Paul, Chris Paul, Paul hit it. Hi, Joel. Can you hear me? This is Chris Charlo. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So my name is um, Kristen Charlo and I'm a human services manager uh, for the city of Tempe and I oversee the CARE 7 program. And uh, our part of the presentation discusses why people become a, a addict, have addiction, how they develop addictions, and to talk about the why, how we get, how we get to this point. Um, and so we align our programming at CARE 7 a lot with adverse childhood experiences. So in 1997, uh, uh, Drs. Anda and Felitti conducted a very large program research study, 17,421 participants, um, and looked at adverse childhood experiences that these individuals had and how it affected the trajectory of their lives. Um, and so, next slide, Paul. It was a very uh, study that considered the following factors, these three categories of abuse, neglect, and household function. So they looked at these adults, and they um, studied their childhood to see if they suffered from physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, and emotional neglect. And if their household had mental illness, an incarcerated relative, uh, violence against the mother in the home, substance abuse, and divorce. So these are the 10 ACEs that uh, we ask people to answer if they experienced the, any of these during their childhood. And the score, if you will, gives us an idea of some of the outcomes that they may have in their adult life. Next slide, please. 
So what we know is that there's a lot of people, about 33% of the population report uh, zero ACEs. So how lucky are they? Um, but we also know that as our ACEs increase, our risk for these maladaptive coping skills also increase. So things like smoking, drinking, using substances, um, obesity, there are mental illness, there are a lot of outcomes associated with ACEs. So when we look at the chart, we can see that when you have experienced zero adverse childhood experiences, about, you have about a one in 69 chance of becoming an alcoholic, one in 480 people use IV drugs, and one in 96 attempt suicide. If you go to the next category, which is one to three ACEs, and remember, divorce is considered an ACE. So a lot of our population has at least one ACE. We see that the, the, the maladaptive behaviors really increase. Now we're to one in nine as an alcoholic, one in 43 using IV drugs, and one in 10 attempt suicide. So quite a significant increase in these behaviors. And then when we go to four to 10 ACEs, you can see it gets incredibly concerning. One in six is an alcoholic, one in 30 uses IV drugs, and one in five attempts suicide. So really, uh, what we also know about ACEs is that they occur in groups. They're very common. To have an ACE as a child, have an adverse childhood experience is incredibly common, and they're usually grouped. If you experience one, you usually experience several others. So unfortunately, um, getting to the four ACEs is not a difficult thing to do. Next slide, please. I think that for CARE 7, for the City of Tempe, how we develop our programming um, is that we take all of this into consideration and we say, we must con consider the potential of childhood trauma when we're addressing program development and specifically uh, those with addiction issues in our community. And we know that 64% of adults who've had one ACE, they are five, or they are um, more likely to have an addiction. And that with four or more ACEs, five times more likely to develop substance use disorder. And when you look at our male population, boys, boys with four or more ACEs are 46 times more likely to become an IV drug user. 46 more times, 46 per, uh, times more likely. And that's concerning. Next slide, please, Paul. So what do we do about it? At CARE 7, we provide a continuum of care and, and both Tempe Fire and Tempe PED have talked about that. We try to develop whole system approaches with um, not just the intervention and the postvention provided by our crisis teams, our mobile crisis teams, but also looking at how do we prevent things like this from occurring and do early intervention. So we do that through um, our youth specialists, which are in all seven of our high schools and six Tempe elementary schools. So we have social workers in the schools that work with students who are struggling and can report having some of these adverse childhood experiences occurring to them in real time. So we can provide programming and supports to help mitigate that. We also have a clinical counseling department that we can make referrals to, and families can get clinical counseling services at low cost or no cost. We have, as I said, um, the 24 hour, seven day a week uh, mobile crisis teams. We have victim services and our newest venture uh, starting in July will be a new unit dedicated to mental health issues in the community. So all of us working together um, can help to identify as early as possible community members who are experiencing ACEs or are at the very beginning of their substance use and we can help uh, intervene and support them so that we don't get to the point where they've lost their job, they've lost their home, they're now homeless, they may be on the street, they're having problems with relationships, no longer um, integrated with their family. 
we want to get to it before it gets to that point. So that's how we try to develop our programming. And I think that's it. Next slide. Thank you. Kristen, outstanding. Thank you guys. Yes. Okay, right now we're going to go ahead and take some questions. And if there's anybody out there that has a question, that either send them in. Tim, I don't know if you can read read some off the uh, panelists. Um, feel free to. Yeah, then. Uh, yeah, Rob Brower has been answering the questions inside the chat. Inside okay. The um, Rob, do you want to share a, a few of them just so? Uh, Got a taste of what's going on. And I'll kind of wrap it up with some other things. Uh, the questions. Yeah. Is that, okay. So one of the one of the questions was uh, uh, on the Good Samaritan law. Uh, are our are our officers being trained on the Good Samaritan law? And essentially, what that's referencing is uh, if a community member or family friend uses uh, Narcan on an individual, um, and there's drugs in the household. You know, are we then going in and, and making arrests based off of that? Because normally, if we're in you know in a in, in a situation where there's a legal activity going on, we're going to be uh, investigating that. And so, with this, uh, 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 we we do um, we in our in our education for our cops when we do our initial training, we have a slide in there that that speaks to the Good Samaritan law. And to date, we haven't made any arrests on, on anyone um, that has called 911 to to ask for help to get some for someone that has overdosed. And so we do we often do a lot of educating as well when we talk to other friends and family members, because there's been several instances where friends have delayed calling and it's cost their friend their life because they delayed because they were cleaning up. They were afraid that uh, because of the illegal drugs and we just try and get across like, no, you, you won't get in trouble. We're not going to, we, we don't care about that. We want to, we want to save someone's life here. So um, it, it really is uh, it educated and also we do education as well in the, in the field. Right. Um, and then the other question was uh, asking about is, is community Narcan available for nonprofits who are working with individuals at, at risk? Um, I, I answer that by just sending them to Erica. I'm sure. Um, uh, Chris, if you want to drop your email in there as well, um, that you can do that and, and answer those questions. I know that um, I think even the Tempe Coalition, uh, through a grant, is offering Narcan. I believe community Narcan for for individuals that that need it. And so there are there's many opportunities through several grant opportunities to get uh, Narcan. So um, if you want to drop your email there as well. Perfect. Anything else, Tim, on questions? Yeah, I did get one question. Um, are homeless persons able to utilize the new mental health issues? And that's for Chris Charlo. Absolutely. Our um, new mental health response team will be dedicated to all community members who have a mental health crisis, but specifically, uh, we want to engage with our homeless community so that we can help manage it. Um, one of the things that we've talked about a lot is that when somebody experiences a crisis, they may not understand the system and people around them may not be able to help them understand that. And so that's gonna be our job is to say, okay, this is what's gonna happen to you. And when you um, are ready and you are ready to reintegrate and, and you come, Maybe you see a doctor and you come back to the community. Let us help put in a system of supports and and engage with us when you need something. Let's not wait until things reach a crisis level. If we can develop relationships and intervene early, then maybe we won't get to the point where people um, are having to do things that are uh, in a crisis situation. So that's our goal is to be able to engage early and often um, to support people throughout their journey, however long that takes. It could be years. We've engaged with, with residents of this community for years and years and years. And then to adjust the level of services to their level of need, and then make sure that their family members are plugged in to supportive services that we can provide as well and that other community agencies can provide. Awesome, thank you. Perfect. Yes. Tim, anything else? Yeah, I had one more that just came in. 
says, okay. what substances does a good Samaritan law cover? Is it just opioids? Robert. Sorry, so I, I have, I was looking at another question. So <laughs> what was, you know, um, there was a, so let me answer this first question. Does PD have any systems in place to intervene with the increase of supply of illicit drugs? Uh, so we work, we, we work pretty closely with the drug enforcement agency uh, and then also uh, HIDA, which is a high intensity drug trafficking uh, agency. And so we have officers that are grant funded through the federal government that are embedded in those units. And so they work uh, uh, very closely with them and, and then also officers in the Southwest uh, to be really monitoring um, you know, drug flow in and out of the country. Interesting, uh, and I, I think it would be really interesting to see as we go through this program with all the data that's coming out, when we make significant drug seizures uh, in the Southwest, uh, seeing decreases in uh, fentanyl overdoses. Uh, and so it, it is, it's very interesting to see and analyze that data um, and see if there's a correlation uh, between interdiction and then, uh, you know, obviously prevention and uh, plays a role, but that interdiction piece is, is very important. So, so we do have those connections with those federal task force uh, in working with interdiction. Um, and then the next question was, what substances does a good Samaritan law cover? Is it just opioids? So I don't, I'm not, I can't speak 100% on that, but my belief is that it, it covers everything. Um, I'm not 100% certain I have to, I'd have to look at it again, but I know when we when we educate our cops, it's uh, it's you know the understanding that we're not taking enforcement action um, in 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 households or or places where there's illegal drugs, um, and so that we, we've been on instances at overdoses where there's other illegal drugs and and we're not taking action enforcement action on that. So that answers. Perfect, Tim. Anything else? Yeah, we had one more just come in. Sure. It says fire says they are using more Narcan doses to revive patients. Is PD seizing more fentanyl, or does this mean that fentanyl out on the street is stronger and more dangerous? Uh, from the PD side, we are seizing more fentanyl. We're also we're also seeing a lot more of. Uh, individuals who had no intention of using heroin or fentanyl and are using other illegal drugs that happen to be cut with fentanyl. And um, so we're seeing we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, and so that goes back to the education piece of, uh, you know, about fentanyl and, and what what drugs are being cut with other drugs. Um, and so from a PD standpoint, yes, we are seeing a I don't have it um, on our other presentations. We have our seizures in fentanyl and it's skyrocketing, um, I guess is the term. Interesting. And from the fire side, um, just to follow up with what Rob was saying, um, absolutely, we're attributing it to that because people on scene of these overdoses are saying, hey, they took a blue M30 pill, which are known to be those, um, those illegal fentanyl pills that are manufactured uh, you know, in other places, and it's not to the same level of manufacturing that you know, USDA puts into place or anything like that. And so while somebody might take one pill, M30 pill, and be okay and, and have zero effects, they might take another M30 pill, and it's 20 times the amount uh, of carfentanil or fentanyl inside of it. Um, those are direct correlations with the amount of Narcan that we're having to use to, to revive patients. So. Yep. There's another question, Tim. Did you see it? Oh, at the very bottom in the Q and A. Um, I think Chris Charlo answered it. Okay. All right. I know there might be a question or two coming in, but I just want to kind of wrap things up here and, and then talk about the typical coalition. Um, first off, I want to tell the panelists, thank you for attending today. This has been awesome, uh, for me, even, uh, just to hear the updates on what we're doing and how we're trying to achieve, uh, with intent B holistically working together 
um, with public safety, human resources, uh, uh, community services, uh, CARE 7, everyone really partnering on this uh, issue with tackling uh, opioids, but it's not just for opioids, it's any addiction or or any uh, um, health concerns. And Rob, I got a question on this one. I, I know we briefly talked about things, what we're talking about today, um, and Christine even brought this up, is when we start tackling these issues at the lowest form, we have a pure opportunity to really help people get on their feet even quicker. And the other thing is when we tackle on the lowest form, it doesn't come, it doesn't evolve into a PD issue. It doesn't evolve into something that we see on the TV um, that puts officers in situations that uh, might require uh, lethal force. And we want to make sure that our community is safe and we want to make sure that this program which we're trying to achieve also has um, the ability to translate across uh, the region here and hopefully nationally. And obviously when we work together like this and we work together collectively, nationally we're trying to find uh, the best practices that we can provide and utilize not only in our community, but in other communities too. For me as a council member, this is great information because when I go back to places like National League of Cities and when this issue continuously comes up along with mental health and homelessness, um, there is a plan. We are, we are testing out plans within our community. We're working together um, collectively, not just PD and fire and community service separately, but collectively together um, to make sure that the transition is smooth. And the one thing that I like about this program that was presented today um, about uh, having uh, the ability, when someone's in crisis, they call 911. That is our true opportunity to make an impression, to help an uh, individual get the help that is needed. When we actually have a counselor or a caseworker that can come to the hospital, that can actually talk to a person in the moment of need and try to get them on track, even if they don't take it that, that point, they know that there is um, help, that there is an avenue, or they know where the direction is to get that help. This is, in my opinion, is one of the game changers that I think that is is going to help us in the long run. Because as these calls continually come in, our support mechanism, that the wraparound service, so to speak, is going to be tremendous when we have that time. Um, also, when we talk about transportation and get them to the right place and right location. When we start when we start working together on solving those little issues that that halt or stop people from getting the care that they need and it could be as easy as i got my appointment i have no ride and done i'm going to move on and i'll forget i'm fine and then they're back again so these little gaps that we're trying to resolve is going to be instrumental in providing a program that's going to be so beneficial for our community and so beneficial to stop things at the lowest level. And Rob, I think you even talked about this program that we're talking, we're utilizing right now, how it could go into the mental health. How can it go into the homelessness to even tackle those issues at the lowest form before they become a bigger issue down the road? And that helps 911 calls in general. That helps your policing calls in general at the lowest form. Once again, we're tackling the issue before they become a bigger issue down the road. And I think this is the stuff that I'm seeing nationally that our communities are talking about. How do we help these people that need help? Not at the end where we see on the news, but at the lowest form. So I'm very proud of this panel um, coming up with these uh, conclusions. I'm very proud of Tempe for what we're trying to do and achieve to help our community. But as you see, and as the data shows, the numbers are rising up. Fentanyl is out there and fentanyl is at any level because they're not doctors that are making this stuff. They are just making it. So we need to do our part to educate and to educate in our high schools. And we're doing these things right now to make sure that our younger generation is understanding that this is a one and done deal. That if you even think you're taking something, you might not be taking what you think you're taking. And if you're taking what you think is fentanyl or some sort of opioid, might be laced with something else, it's going to kill you. So um, this has been a great presentation. Uh, I want to also talk with, talk about the Tippy Coalition. I'm going to read something here. Um, their mission is to reduce underage drinking and drug use with our youth and, and support the parents in, in educating them and our community members. Um, also, um, understanding prescriptions and, and what they may entail. 
So the coalition is working closely together with our panelists here today, and, and they've been uh, involved in various ways to help our community out in, in maintaining grant funding and money to help provide um, services across the board. So at the end of this presentation, and Tim's probably gonna help direct um, people to it, there is a survey that they actually need to help uh, filled out. Uh, this is gonna help them uh, with their studies and also to help them maintain funding to, to, to support these services that we see even here today and support other initiatives that they do. So um, with that, I want to uh, make sure that we get that information out. I also wanna um, tell people that uh, both uh, Councilmember Darlene Garland and I, every fourth Friday of the month, um, we have our uh, community safety uh, council committee, which we take on 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 these issues. We basically hear these um, uh, collaborative works that are being um, demonstrated within our city on public safety, on uh, human health, on things that are going to make our our community even better. Um, so every fourth uh, Friday of the month, uh, I believe usually at noon. We uh, have this uh, committee and uh, these presentations are presented and we encourage the public to attend if they would like to learn more about what is going on within our community. So there it is. Um, Tim, anything else I'm missing? No, sorry, but the link for the survey in the chat as well as the link for the council committee in the chat. Yep. So please, if you are out there, please take advantage of the survey. Uh, we had this presentation within under an hour um, I like what we achieved here today. This is, it's almost like I'm thinking about going to a 20 minute talk. You know, if we do that 20 minute talk within 20 minutes and, and then have some questions after that, I think people might be uh, really informed on some new um, issues that are coming up down the road. This is outstanding guys. Um, I want to tell you that I think we have an even interest in the news media that are going to be talking about this um, later on and hopefully tonight. I think this information does need to be broadcast and uh, we need to show what we're doing within our community and hopefully we can uh, be a template for other communities to follow. So I want to uh, tell you, tell the panel, thank you for your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your lunch. You got about five, six, seven minutes here. Just get something down. Um, but and, and for our audience too, um, please thank you for uh, attending and uh, once again. Uh, we'll do another job with Joel and uh, bring some more information out. So, Tim, anything else? We're done. Nope, I think we're done. All right, guys, thank you again. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Take care. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you. Thank you.